What's up, baby? Man, I'm feeling good. Welcome to the Mental Margarita Show. I got a legend here, man. This is a living legend. Gene Groove Allen. Appreciate that, bro. Really do. I mean, the face, man. I mean, I grew up to this face. <laughs> and some of the classics, first and foremost, actor, rap artist, voiceover artist, nonprofit executive director, yeah, it's a lot. And a financial wizard. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, bro. It's, it's a, a lot. whole lot of hats, man. <laughs> you know what? I, I find that um, my my journey has always been, you know, it, even when people think that their journey is what they planned and what they wanted, you'll find that at the end of the day, it, it, it's God's plan, you know, and that and that's for real, for real. That is so for real. That's that's the that's the honest truth. Right when you think that it's yours, you realize that it's his. Not even, uh, close. Not even close. Put something on that. And and you know what? God had a plan for you. But let's take it back. Where where do you where where are you from? Where do you start out? Okay. How did okay. you get this musical and acting bug? Um, I I, I put like this, you know, um I'm originally from Brentwood, Long Island. Long Island, New York, um, and, you know, my family, you know, middle class, lower middle class, you know, always playing music. So I loved music. I, even, I don't know why, but I just loved music. And literally, you know, to be very transparent, you know, from Jackson, I, my father played all types of songs. Literally, I would hear from Frank Sinatra to oh, Dolly man. Parton to the Ohio Players. So my idea of music... It was kind of crazy you know right um, but it, it gave me the love of 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 music being different for all kind of demographics but that one the one main thing was that it it it, it made you feel a certain way right so my first concert was the jackson five bro oh my goodness man listen this is before uh, this uh michael you know <laughs> no, right and, and and that that kind of changed my life because that I wanted, you know, I heard the screaming and the people dancing and there the lights is flashing and flashing. And I knew that's what I want to do. I want to be on that stage. So, you know, I would I would practice dancing and singing and all kind of things. And in New York, there's four things you can do. You know, if anybody from New York, you can do you can be um officer of the law. Right. And I shoot first. That's questions later. So that's not good. You can do some crime. Now, I'm knocking nobody's hustle. I can't do bars. Right. You can't do it. You can work in a hospital, which I did. Worked in the hospital for a long period of time because a lot of um, hospitals, um, shout out to the hospitals. Um, or you rap, do music. And I was fortunate enough to meet up with a gentleman that really changed my life again. Name is DL. Um, Derwin Rump, he came from the Bronx. What? And, and he had these tapes, man, you know, these 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 mixtapes, we call them. And it was the tapes of Furious Five, um, Their Master Flash, Melly Mel, Raheem, Cowboy, Creole, Kick Creole. Uh, Kick it was Creole. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, um, Andre Harrell. Shout out to Andre Harrell. Shout out to uh, Alonzo Brown. Um, it was the, uh, had Treacherous Three, um, DJ oh, Hollywood, man. all these different tapes, and when I heard it, I, I I was like, oh my god! It was list. I was so we would listen to these tapes like over and over again, like for two, three, four, five months. We go to the basement, play the tapes, play the tapes, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and wow. and that that was that's how I began and in, into in being you know uh, I wanted to emulate rappers, DJs. I hip hop was 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 my thing. I loved it. I fell in love. That's amazing. And so here's my question. Was was the music thing, as far as you going through this journey and you wanting to be this, and you're like, man, this is something that I want to do, what came professional first? Was it the music or was it the acting? Mm. 
So, <laughs> so a lot of people don't realize. So when the acting came about, house um, house party. You know, you're talking about eighties, nineties. We're we're in, we go to parks, and so I became an MC. I started writing rhymes and going to the house parties and all this kind of stuff that um really made sense to what we needed to do. Right. And if if you go back when you're in a park, you know you go to these parks and DJs is rocking and the whole nine, and that's how you built your credibility. That's how you built your you know what. So we were rapping a long time, even before that. We wasn't, I wasn't thinking about acting. At that time, nobody was, you know, nobody was really thinking about rappers and being acting. And now that's the thing. That's the norm. Right, right. But, you know, we really built our platform, our, our situation based upon being outside, being outdoors, battling, um, connecting, building crews, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, my start was with the, the, the Rock Squad. Um, the Rock Squad. Yeah, yeah. Um, shout out to the Rock Squad, Smitty D, you know, Jerry J, and a lot of people don't know PMD, you know, Parish of EPMD is, is Smitty D's brother. So and on our album, he's actually the DJ with, with a turntable, you know, with a with a wow. technique under his arm. And he was on he was on that album. Um, but you know, that's how we that's how I started, you know, really rock squad and I wanted to do a record, and Jerry Jerry J Jeremiah Jones he went to the Navy. Um, James Smith Smitty D he wanted to be he wanted to be a police officer. He did that, but I got bitten by the bug, you know. And I wanted to do a record, and you know we culminated into uh, Ruby Chill, and we we were fortunate, you know, we were fortunate to get a record deal. Wow, extremely fortunate. And so yeah. now that you have this record deal, what was how how you feeling now? I mean, are you bugging out? You going crazy? You feel like a rock star? Yo, you, you know, when you first sign that deal, you feel like, yo, I'm going to be a millionaire. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're going to get money, baby. That, that's Andre's famous saying. It's, it's <laughs> not uptown, you know. I, and, I, and I still believe, um, other, you know, other than Def Jam, it, um, you know, Death Row, Uptown Records was so iconic. Matter of fact, oh. no, I'm saying it's the top iconic. And the reason why I say this is because it has been able to develop artists that to today are winning lifetime achievement awards. That's um, so true. When we signed to Uptown, you know, it was it was an idea of Andre. He worked for Def Jam. He did road managing. You know, he was an artist, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Um, and, and that was kind of funny because to, to say that, you know, when I was in high school listening to, you know, I'm the J-E-C-K-Y-L-L top of world trade to the depths of hell and 25 years later i'm signing to this man's label and he's the reason why i got started that's god wow. i don't care what anybody said that so, is god you know what i mean that's um, divine intervention definitely, definitely so you know we, we signed to this label we were the last ones to be signed um we were working with this gentleman i call him you know uh, boy genius nate tinsley um, shout out to nate tinsley um he was working with these guys in queens these guys are connected to Andre. He had just signed this multi-million dollar deal with MCA Records, and he needed one more artist. And he heard one of our songs, I think it was Why Me, or Dragon Breath. You know, um, <laughs> our style was more comedic, you know, um, and he's like, I'm going to meet them. So they gave us a call at like 5 o'clock. You know, we're in, we're in Long Island, they're in Queens. He says, you got 30 minutes to get there. And it's a 45 hour drive, but we made it in 20 minutes. I, <laughs> literally. And we was in this small room to the point where I I could smell Andre's breath. That's how close we were. Wow. And, and we were performing, we were dancing, performing our song, Why Me or Dragon, whatever it was. But you what know. Did, what, did he have a dragon breath? No, oh before. my God. It was about a girl <laughs> that had like this crazy breath, you know what I mean? And he got dragon breath, you know what I mean? It was, you know, but he loved it. He loved the he loved the fact that we were ready. And and this yeah. is what I say now to to the people say, Well, what do you what do you know, how do you get into and what what did you tell most artists is getting be ready. Be That's ready. Right. Whatever you think you, you know, we I remember being in the basement before we had shows. We we if we were playing in the park at someone's barbecue at the high school, we practiced routines, dance steps, rapping. Listen to the that's what we did. Like two, three, four, five hours. 
go upstairs, get some beats, and go back down, do another two, three, four hours. Right. Um, I think that's missing. The artists don't really do that. The they artist really development think. is definitely missing. Yes. But um, yeah. Once we signed, man, we we thought we were, we, you know, we were gonna be millionaires. You know, Heavy D. You know, Woody Rock. Shout out to Woody Rock, Marley Marley. Heavy Mar D. Oh. It, it, you know, it was crazy, and we were in competition. It, it, it was funny because everybody's like, you know, trying to to vie for Andre's attention. Oh, here we are, here we are. Right. And, um, it, it, it was, but it was still, it was still family oriented. We were still family. We were still loving each other, and you know, it, it was, it was a scenario where, and in retrospect, when I think about how we were and how we should have been. We didn't really know ourselves. Right. And that's, I think that was the reason why we weren't as people didn't realize we were rappers. We had an album out. No one knew about it. Because we right. didn't really know ourselves. Because if we knew ourselves, then Andre and then we know how to do what we they needed to do. Right. Right. You know I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. And and hindsight is always 2020. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, nowadays, and I and I put it like this: still, people don't understand that hindsight or that lesson that you learned. And if you're still living by that old lesson, or still doing the same things that that old lesson tried to 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 to, to turn you, try to talk to you about, try to teach you, you're still right. doing those very same mistakes. You're gonna be exactly where you are. That's right. That is deep. And it's the truth. And 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 fortunately for you, you were able to move from where you were. And now let's talk about your big breaks that are coming in. How did this happen with, with, with House Party? So, 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 okay, so, you know, we're frustrated. Everybody's vying for attention. Heavy D is the first video out. He's, you know, Heavy D is the man. Heavy D was, was Andre's point. He was the man. Yeah. You know, he's supposed to. But you know, it was like, okay, so how do we how do we do what we need to do? So every he all the up um the uptown um crew was in Heavy D's first video. And the call times in Queens said, like, all right, everybody be there at seven o'clock, eight o'clock. So I'm about business. I said, Yo, fellas, we're gonna be there at five. We're gonna get there early, make sure we get the right spots, whatever the case may be. And we met the Hudlin brothers, Reggie and Warrington. Shout out to the Hudlin brothers. They wow. the um and you know, we, we we talk to them. We 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 really, you know, they say, "Hey, who are you?" We're Groovy Chill, and you know, we we talked about what do you guys do, and we talk about some things. We, you know, we do some house party, you know, house party. That's how we make money. You know, what I'm saying we go to a house, we get some pay, get paid, you know, drink some some old English, turn on the red light, whatever the case may be. Right. So, <laughs> so you know, and they were really interested. And at the end of the 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 shoot of of, of Mr. Big Stuff, I remember Warrington. I spoke to Warrington Hudlin maybe about two years ago. On, on on a podcast on a TV show that I do, and he said, "Groove, you don't understand. You guys first, y'all came there early, y'all helped us, and at the end of the shoot, everybody left, and they were moving chairs and wow. stuff. They had to do it themselves, and they said y'all stayed and helped us. And he said we knew, you know, in terms of um the kind of character we had, right? And, and that 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 always that's always going to stick with me. And that's awesome." Exactly. You know, so when we did uh, Uptown's Kicking It, they came to us and said, like, listen, we've been working on working on this treatment, working on this idea about house parties. We'd love to, to, to sit with you and learn about all of that. So for two years, you know, so in the meantime, we're trying to do this album. We're trying, you know, we're upset with the press. We're not we're not getting the the um, the attention that we think we deserve because we're, you know, in these hours of putting together music. And honestly, I got to say. If you don't know, and and we as, as as youngsters thinking that we're these big production, we've got the ideas of what the people want to hear. Sometimes right. you get clouded. That's right, um, and should. that's another story. We, we, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the the album. But I remember, you know, Andre and Harrell, you know, they weren't paying us attention. We were frustrated. We went up to Uptown, and everybody's popping up, and now they got Father MC and. You know, yo, you know, we 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 frustrated, and we got this call. They said, "Listen, um, this is Reggie Hudlin, this is Warrington Hudlin. We have, uh, we we have a studio that's interested in doing our movie, and we want you to audition for these parts of these roles." Wow! So they sent us um, the roles for House Party. Um, I was going to play the role of Clay, 
Um, and Daryl Mitchell, my brother, he was going to play the role of Kid. And oh. Bilal, DJ Bilal, be successful, Groove Be Chill, was going to play the role of Martin Lawrence. Which, if everybody what? knows. Yeah, yeah. Martin Lawrence's name is Bilal in the movie. So we got, I, I still got the script. Groove. Oh, my goodness. Bilal. And, and so, it, and at that time, it was with, um, it was with Disney. And we went uptown, went to Manhattan. And so, there, so we already been prepping, you know, um, doing a lot of, um, doing a lot of um, acting classes and improv. And you got to remember, I'm with these brothers. These are my brothers. We've been hanging and vibing, driving for four Ever. So we're in front of these people and we got the lines. So me and Dow, we knocked out the park. Bang. Then they throw us stuff. They're giving us improv. So we're killing it. You you can't throw me nothing with my brother. We're killing it. We, we ah, yeah, yeah. They, ah, you guys, you're so funny. Oh, I love you. We love you. Oh, my God. <laughs> so the husband said, like, yo, y'all got this. So we knew. We I knew right then. I left that. I left Manhattan knowing that I'm going to be a movie star. Wow. We didn't have a hit record. We didn't have a hit record. Um, New Line Cinema took over. And they said, yeah, groovy, chill. But um, we need, let's see something. We need some star power. And, you know, Kid and Play was hot. Shout yeah, out to Kid and Play. They were hot. They were crazy. You know, they they were they were making they were making noise. They were it wasn't even noise. They were just killing it in terms yeah, of been killing it. Yeah, the fans, sales, just visibility, and um, yeah. they got the roles. You know, so as we talk about it now, like they made like five million. I made about five thousand, but I'm not bitter. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that, that's and that's important. And that leads to house party too. Yeah, man. We did, they, they gave a call back, you know, and it's funny because we were sag now, because we did house party. But sag now, if I'm if I spent if I step on that stage, once I step on the set, y'all gotta pay me like scale. So instead of being like a, a longer role, they like kind of put me a quick oh, there he is. Okay, now he's gone. So I got like maybe a thousand dollars, you know. But it's it's all good. Everything happens for a reason, bro. Everything, Everything. happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason, and and then I mean you move on to Boomerang, and you, you and then you you keep going. The Hudlin brothers. brothers helped us out on that one. You know they did that, and and that the the most thing that I got from that piece was it allowed me, even though it was a, even though our scene was even cut. I think you see like the back of my head, you know, for some reason I had dreads at the time, and um, but the, I think the 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 memory that I get was we had a chance to. It was me. It was it was chill. And we had a chance to go one on one, like improv with Eddie Murphy. And to me, wow. that that man, you know, he he probably won't remember. If I said, "Hey, Eddie," he's like, "Hey, whatever." Um, but that was so it meant a lot to me because Eddie Murphy at that time was an icon. Now oh, he's an a, a incredible legendary icon. But right. just to say, like, we were trading snaps and all this kind of back and forth, quick, quick, you know, like, yo, my man, you know, it's it's, it's what's up, so. That's always going to be with me. And after that, I kind of like, I kind of um tried to path, do my own path. Chill had started doing his acting thing while I was doing this production thing. And I just tried to find my own path. And finding your own path was great. But one thing that I love is that through your journey of acting, all the wonderful people that you worked with, from Martin Lawrence to uh, Tisha Campbell, to Eddie Murphy, to Angela Bassett, to Lauren. Um, Lawrence Fishburne. I mean, come on. This is. I mean, these these are our heroes. Yeah, yeah. If you were fortunate enough. God bless you and put you in that position. When, when you're in, I'm gonna tell you like this. When you are, when you're in the moment, you don't understand that you're in the moment. I know. And, and now, like as you get older, as you get older, you're I'm like, oh, yeah, this, this is the moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like right now, this is a moment. Right yeah. now, this is a moment. You know what I'm saying? And I gotta like, this is a moment. This, 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 this is right here, because I'm I'm remember sitting in um, what's love got to do with it? I I I lived in California. I moved to California, LA for about a year and a half, two years. Um, shout out to Nitro. Shout out to Peter Work. We um, he was doing, oh, he was like an in house doing jingles, commercial jingles. He said, Groove, I know you want to do music. Why don't you come out here? Coming with some jingles, you know, there's there's agents and all that kind of stuff. So I moved out and they had this call, passing call for, you know, what's love got to do with it. And 
I remember meeting Ruben Cannon. And, you know, if anybody does any research, Ruben Cannon, at the, before I knew who Ruben Cannon was, you saw all these iconic TV shows and always say Ruben Cannon. So I'm thinking he's a white boy. I'm thinking, you know, I walked in and he's a, he's a brother. I was like, oh, so now I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, my goodness, because I know his work. Wow. So I'm in there auditioning. I killed the spot. But my height because I, I was I was supposed to be a band member. I was going to be a band member. Just got more time on the screen. Um, <laughs> but they, everybody was like 6'2", and I was like 5'11". And that makes a difference in Hollywood. So um, they, they gave me the part. But I remember sitting in the trailer, and Lawrence and, and, and Angela's right there, and they're like, they real cool. And Lawrence said, always, always remember, you know, you know, you can always do better. Um, you know, this, this is going to be a great movie for you. But, you know... I want to see what you do next. You know, it was it was just those crazy kind of conversations that I was able to to have, and and I still take to this day, man. So you know, like I said, man, cherish the moments, but also remember that those moments, and 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 do the best you can in those moments. It's so important. It's so important to cherish them those moments. Yes, you know, because a, a lot of times, you know, we complain in general. <laughs> man, this man. I mean, listen. we complain, True. and sometimes you got to just take a couple steps back and say, "Man, you know what? This is beautiful." You have to, you have to, and 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 unfortunately, we don't we don't get it until sometimes. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's right on time. But you know, when you really understand that, sometimes you have to be thankful for what you have, um, yeah. thankful for the opportunities that you have. Like even this, this is an opportunity for me. Um, you know, shout out to Sunshine Nicole Dalton. You know what I mean? She, you know, she's always been looking out. That's that's my sis. And you know, she said, "Hey, you want to?" Like, yeah, that's how we do because you you never know. You never know. And and I'll say this: my um my mantra, I say we are the purpose. Um, when when my brother Chill had a TV show called Brothers on Channel. Channel on Fox, you know. On Fox, yeah. Yeah, you know, shout out to Carl Weathers, R.I.P. That's my man. Uh, um, we, we went out there, it was me, my other mother, brother Crash, Corey, Corey Crash, and he's on the he's on the Pacific Ocean. He's got this little condo. We're up on the rooftop, we're sipping champagne, you hear the water, sun is uh, shining, like, oh, this is incredible. Come on. You know what I'm saying? Like this. I said, I don't want to never come home. And I, I said, yo, I want to come back. I, I got to find come back. And he said, you got to have a purpose. And we call it GAP, G-H-A-P, got to have a purpose. So I went back to New York. And I'm like, okay, I'm looking for a purpose. I got to find a purpose. I got to find a purpose. <laughs> and, and it took me a while, a long time. I finally realized that the purpose was inside me. Mm. God already gave me the purpose. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to look. How? And... Mm. Right now, I feel that the purpose that I have is for, like, no one helped me to where I wanted to be, where I wanted to go. Now, was it their fault? Was it my fault? I don't know. But I know that now I want to make sure that anybody I come in contact with or mm. as I go up in platforms and tears, whatever, I'm going to try to help you. If you say, I want to be the best janitor, I want to own this this building, I'm going to find a way to be free to own the building. Right, producer, blah 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 blah. I'm gonna find a way to help you meet that producer, and and vice versa. And that's when I say we are the purpose. Whatever I can do to help you, like real talk, you. Right. Whatever I can help you, my man. That's just just your growth, and that's what right. we do. We are the purpose. Absolutely, and and that olive branch is extended out to you as well. I appreciate that. And not only that, purpose has manifested itself and you are touching so many people educating them on financial freedom literacy tell me about that um so i i remember so i i, I remember doing house party one and i'm, I'm coming back home <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go back to new york so i'm thinking i got an album i didn't just shook hands with sylvester stallone and arnold schwarzenegger and i'm gonna be paid nah bro I ended up going home looking for a job. And so I ended up um, kind of two things. I became um, 
you know, worked in the hospital. So I actually got my nursing license. So LPN, but I was also working for a brokerage house. And, you know, I don't know if anybody remembers the the, the uh, movie Boiler Room. You had a bunch of people in one oh, room yeah. calling clients. And that's what I did for like two, three years. Like, hey, Mr. Johnson, this is Gene Allen calling about Gap. And right now, Gap is at $25 a share. Now, if you and we would go through these and get people to, you know, and I, you know, I manifested and transitioned, um, started getting my education and really start learning about investments and, when I got to, I moved from the Long Island area, New York, to D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, it was just a, an ability to, for me to now talk to people that of color, people that didn't understand what investments were, people didn't understand financial literacy, businesses, all that kind of thing. I found that that became my purpose. So I needed wow. to go to the local churches. I needed to go to the local communities. And I worked for a bank. You know, but sometimes banks don't reach out to where the people that really need it need to be. Need it, right. I, I was that bridge. I became that bridge. And, and that was my focus. Wow. That became your focus there. And you know what? We need it so desperately. Still do. You know, it's a sad, it's sad, it's a sad thing when they have this statement that says that if you want to hide something from our people, just put it in a book. And it's true. And and I don't get me wrong, man. I I, I still like this. I need to read something. I need to right. read something. It's really about your mindset. Right. Um, you know, I find that um there, there's two types of energies, negative energy and positive energy. And being a human, being we're all human, you know, you tend to be a little bit of both. I think to really excel in what you want, really move forward on what you want, you have to work on pushing back that negative. And really embracing and really pushing for that positive. And I think that that, that's the key to winning, for me anyway. It is the key to winning. You got to, because if that neg if that negative energy, if it consumes you, hmm. oh Lord. So let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me tell you a little story. So for man, so after you know, Groovy Chill breaks up, you know, everybody's going their separate ways. I I, I was depressed. Oh man, I was depressed. And, you know, I'm not talking about the kind of depression where I'm in a hospital, but there's always levels of that, you know, yeah. and, and there's always levels always can be defined, you know, and, and I, I blamed everybody for everything for me not being where I wanted to be. I blamed my mother, my, 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 my girlfriend, who's my wife at the time. I blamed the group chill, but like everybody. everybody was the reason why I wasn't where I wanted to be. And literally let's say eight, nine, maybe like 10 years ago, I started realizing, one, I was tired of being tired of where I was. But more importantly, and 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 and, and this is a key. I, I spoke to my brother, Chill, just randomly we were talking. He said, um, he was at this place somewhere where it stars and it looked great. And I said, I, wanna, I wish I was there. And he said, you're already there, bro. He says, you're already there. And at the time he said it, I didn't, I didn't receive it. Right. But I realized, you know, during that time, during the transition, I started doing a lot of self-help reading and, and just, you know, pushing for that positive energy. And I realized that the man in the mirror was the reason why I wasn't who I wanted to be. Yeah. I wasn't into, I wasn't doing the acting because I didn't do what I needed to do. I wasn't doing more voiceover because I didn't do what I wanted to do. I wasn't there up on stage at, at shows rocking the house because I didn't do what I wanted to do. And once I wow. released that, once I got that off my back, you know, and 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 even like address, I addressed my brothers about this, you know what I'm saying? Me and Charlie, I said like, yo, for a minute, I was blaming and and it was wrong. Whether whether he did or didn't was wrong. Yeah. You know, it was on me. And literally I saw, you know, the, the light, so to speak, it and God brought me so many different opportunities and 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 def definitely my journey has been like where i'm at now is god you can't tell me it ain't and let's talk gotta change, you got to change your face you know what i mean you got to change your face but let's talk about those opportunities i got it right here post cereal yeah, voice crazy. coca cola Crazy. potato chips yeah man and there's some good potato chips man so so my first <laughs> one was pringles and i remember we was um 
it was before I moved to LA, we was going to New York and I'm thinking that was when voiceovers, they were trying to get into more hip, be more hip and rapping, all kind of stuff. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the studio and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking that this is going to be like, you know, some beats, some music, you know, potato chips and we on my lips and we popping Pringles. Yeah, we popping Pringles. And the music was was what you know, my man made the music very corny, but more importantly, the the um one of the executives was there. And he said, No, I want potato chips to cross your lips. Pop the Pringles. Oh my god. Yeah, man, really? And I did it. You know, we worked on that for two, three days. It, it was a greasy mess, you know. But me learning uh -huh. the business now, you got to, first of all, he's the one that pays the check. You got to do what you got to right. do. Right. Yeah, do what you got to do. What we think the audience wants to hear is nothing compared to what these marketing researchers do and all the, all the numbers. And and by the time I finish, it, it was, to me, it, it's still corny. But my first year, I made like a hundred grand off of wow. that one commercial because it was a national. You know what I mean? I was like, "Oh, I love this." Who else? Who's next? So we ended up doing post cereal. Yeah. <laughs> we ended up doing post cereal Toyota, uh, post cereal. You know, shout out to MC Search because he had the honeycombs, and they had two versions. He had the fly version. He had, "Ooh, hey, oh, I got the mean for the crunch." Mine was like. We I love the taste. Well, we just love the taste. I uh -huh. it. I got paid, but you know, he had the real smoothed out version, but it's all good. Uh -huh. That's amazing that you, you know, so so talking like we were talking. You know, here you are. You said, yeah. you know what, I release this this thing that I, I'm going through. Yep, yep. Yeah, because we talk about this in the show and, and, and mental margarita. What is your mental margarita? What is your escape? And we deal with mental health because depression, depression is real, brother. It is. It is. And, you know, like I said, there's different levels to it. For me, it was really about manifesting uh, what I was doing, what I was not doing, and, and looking in that mirror and saying, okay, this is, you have to change this, you have to change that and physically do that. Um, yeah. You know, for some, you know, it might be a chemical scenario. You know, I, I worked in site in the hospital on Long Island. So I understand. I'm a nurse. So I understand exactly what it is and what it isn't. Um, sometimes it's just about taking a look and changing, you know, your 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 your, your outlook, changing um, your 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 ability to, you know, have glasses half full or half empty. Right. Um, and I I think that plays a lot of it, it plays a lot into it for some. You know, for me that's what it was. And once I was able to release that and be honest to myself. You know, I, I, you know, God has manifested in so many ways, you know, me um, doing, you know, a, 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 a CBD line, health and wellness, um, me and Chill working on a, a biopic wow. uh, for, for him, um, uh, me doing, you know, a, a, a TV show that we're looking to syndicate with uh, some, some of my other teammates, you know, shout out to Soundwave Live, Juan Kuhn, Jessica Call, uh, you know, shout out to Dow Show Mitchell. You know, shout out to Commodore. You know, in the, in, in in the independent entertainment. You know, it's just a lot of a lot of connection based upon my outlook. Right. And I, people come to me now, like this one gentleman, um, Anthony Commodore. He does a lot of um, uh, production, movies, BET biopics, the whole nine. V very talented brother. Um, and I didn't know he lives around the corner from me. Wow. <laughs> And I, uh, another friend of mine had tagged him, and I said, "Oh, yo, we want to, you know, we need to connect. You know, I know you see about you talk to my sister." For a year, he didn't, he didn't connect. He didn't for the year. He didn't say nothing. Didn't say nothing. He was like, "Yeah, I see you," uh, uh -huh. but he watched my social media page. And I'm all about. I don't do none of the negative, none of the none of the trash, none of the none of the shade, none of the no. mess. I'm, I'm not about that. Right. You know? And he 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 respected that, but more importantly. He came back to me and said, look, you know, I have my team look at your, your social media to see what kind of person you are. Because honestly, we know social media is, is unfortunately, uh, it's, it's the cloak we wear. Right. And um, he said, and, yes. you are positive. 
and, and that's a lot to me. The, to me, that's uh, that's so cool that you want to be a public representation of who you truly are. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are a public representation of what they're not. Ah, ooh, ooh, that was a good one. I'm going to write that down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, that, that, that right. works out good. And, and not only that, you're walking in your purpose. Yep. And, and you have a Maybe. saying like to say we are the purpose every time every time i meet somebody every time i meet somebody i, I you know we are the purpose that that's so important to me because that's, at the end of the day, that's how that's how we're gonna move forward that's how we're gonna move all the people forward we are the purpose brother we are the purpose word, word and you know what word. i just want to let you know that this has been such an honor and a privilege to have you on the show because Amen. when i watch house party and 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 you know i was young and i, I loved hip-hop you know mm -hmm. i still do to this day all right all right i know you do but i remember seeing you and there was something there was something that you attracted on camera you you, you had you, you had a glow about you for the time that that, that you were seen on camera there was something about your character that really stood out. And Thank it was you. you. It wasn't the character that was designed. It was you. It I was the flow that you have in yourself. I appreciate that, man. And man, I want you to keep shining, my brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will, man. God got me doing nothing else. And I, I'll tell you this. Any way I can help you? Like, you know, as a matter of fact, no. I know we're going to be helping each other. I know it. I put it out yeah. there. Put it out in the atmosphere. You know, I'm claiming God, 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 got my witness. That's how we do, man. And and that's how we're going to continue to move forward because there's a lot of forces that don't want to see us move forward. Yeah, that's so true, my brother. We'll shake that off. Yeah. Let's shake the world, my brother. Pleasure um, to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, Gene Green Allen. Number love. Number love, my brother. I'm going to talk to you, all right? Well. All right, man. Peace. Yeah. You know, people are going to as they're as they're listening to this, they're going to really understand how instrumental you were, and 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 music, in certain sounds. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Dr. Dre, American rapper, radio personality, producer, actor, former MTV VJ for the greatest show on earth. Yo, MTV Raps. How you doing there? Good day. How are you doing? Um, I'm well. Never was a VJ. Always was the host. Yo, MTV Raps today. Thank you so the much. The host. <laughs> my my bad. This is what I no, get. No, no, it's okay. It's okay because people say it all the time. We just, we, we clarify that because we were hired to be hosts of Yo, MTV Raps today. From okay, Fat Five so Freddy, Ed Lover, T-Money, myself, we were hosts of the show. But DJ is fine. It's no, no insult, not at all. <laughs> and 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 I'm telling you, you you are, oh man, just pulverizing in so many ways. Um, but you actually started off obviously in New York. You, Westbury, New York is where you were born. Yes, Westbury, Newcastle. I lived in a place called Newcastle. Went to school in Westbury. But yes. So that's kind of cool. Your mother was from uptown. Your father was from Queens. So you had a, a good combination of things that, that were going on. I had an incredible combination. My mother was Harlemite. My father was uh, from Queens, a Jamaican from Queens, whose parents come from the island of Jamaica. So I, I've had all type of mixed cultures. I had family in every borough and every other island when you hit the, the, the great Caribbean. So I was a blessed, blessed guy. Very blessed guy, and uh, I just want to. I, I just want to make a side note. December fifth, uh, nineteen sixty three. But December fifth, I'm a Sagittarius myself. November thirtieth, so we're only a oh. few days apart. Congratulations! 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 It's uh, <laughs> uh twelve five sixty three is an iconic moment. Just turning the turning six zero. Oh, I don't feel my life has changed, but my wisdom my experience 
and my blessings have grown. What can I say? Oh man, that's just fantastic. That that, that really is, and I, you know, I feel Thank the you. same. And uh, starting just, as I'm, the D, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm so sorry. No, starting as so you, you know you started as a DJ. Yes, I did. I started and, and as the, I started as a DJ, but originally a trumpet player in a band. Uh, I actually sang in my sixth grade band uh, that we put together. And I started DJing because I wanted to meet women. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to find the nicest way to put it, but no. I, I was at a party in Lakeview at my cousin's house, and they had a block party. And they had a band and a DJ. And at that time, DJing wasn't what, what, what it eventually became. And I watched the band and was real excited about the band. Like, yeah, band, this is great. The group's name is Slave. Oh, my goodness. And we heard Slide for the first time. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm watching all the girls. And then the guy in between the set started playing records. And I looked at oh. him, and all the girls were running up to him. And he would have that look, you know, that look on a DJ's face where they want to go, yes, but leave me alone. I'm playing the records. And he would nod his head, nod his head. Now, my cousin Kevin, who I call an extraordinary uh, empresario of DJing, he had 12 turntables in his bedroom. So every time we had a barbecue <laughs> at his house, he would always have stacks and stacks and stacks of records from Marvin Gaye, James Brown, the Jackson Five, Earth, Wind and Fire, Parliament Funk, Godelic, you name it, he had it. And he would DJ with switches on the wall. And I was just fascinated, like, how does he do that? But wow. the guy that really made, and I never found this guy's name, is when I looked at him and I saw all those girls running up to him, and I watched how he con he creatively dismissed them and continued to play music and watch how the reaction from the crowd. I said, I don't know how he does that, but I got to do that. You got to do that. <laughs> got to do that. My brother went to college. He became um, a college DJ, uh, Fred Hollywood Brown. I watched him do that, and I said, I got to do that. If I can do that <laughs> and I can do the records, I can talk to a lot of women. This is a good idea. This is good, right? This is a good <laughs> idea. So that, well, that that was my introduction into getting on the, the we, I call them turntables extraordinaire in the beginning. It wasn't like just the one and twos. It was like, okay, that, that, those and stacks and stacks of records. What can I say? <laughs> It was a great idea because I mean you're going to what? Um Adelphi University. I started at Nassau Community College, got on the dean's list. I started dating this beautiful woman who wore these red leather pants at one of my cousin's birthday, I mean birthday pool parties. And it was like 80 degrees outside, and she came to this thing in long, hot, red leather pants. <laughs> and I looked at her. And I said to my cousin, I said, come here, what? Come here. He said, what? I said, who is that? Oh, that's <laughs> just my friend Pam. I must know her. So every record I played, I played such that woman would shake that booty. And there was red leather pants. And this is at a pool party where everybody's walking around with, you know, swimming trunks, bikinis, you know, <laughs> bathing suits. She's right. in her leather, red leather pants. Oh. And it's 90 degrees. So I saw those red leather pants. I did everything I could to get to know her. And eventually, when she graduated, I took her to her prom. But when she graduated and said, I'm going to Adelphi University, I said, so am I. <laughs> and it was really cool because of one great thing. I was on the dean's list. My, my uh, Black social philosophy teacher had me going to Cornell University upstate. Had me on a free ride, everything in there. And I said, Well, I need to go to Adelphi. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? I followed the big button to smile. Can't can't lie. That's what happened. Oh. <laughs> Long before there was poison, there was me following a big button to smile. <laughs> and yeah, and you know what? That that led to some good things because you meet some DJs, you form the concept crew. Well, the concept was always there. I was DJing since I was uh, 14. Um, the concept was uh, T-Money, myself, Easy G Rockwell, E-Ski, uh, e um, AJ, 
Um, rappers were the Gangsta Rock MCs with Rapper G, Kool Aid D, and um, we DJed all over the place because being a Jamaican that I am, I love making the bass sound and buying big speakers and was always impressed by those sound clashes from Brooklyn to Queens and going to parties, watching Infinity Machine, the Disco Twins, King Charles. And I was always like, oh, God, I got to build a system like that. So, you know, it took a long time, took a lot of working, took a lot of crazy jobs, but we built a hell of a system and we decided to be DJs. And we DJed almost all the way up until we were signed as uh, the concept at Def Jam Recordings. But everything actually came out of Adelphi University becoming a recording artist when we were, uh, when I was in my black um, music class with the late great uh, Dr. Andre Strober and had a few classmates that some people may know. A gentleman by the name of Harold McGregor, AKA Harry Allen, I gotta ask him. Uh, Mr. Bill Stephanie, who became vice president of Def Jam, eventually become president of Def Jam recordings. And of course, a guy named Carlton Riddenauer, AKA Chucky e. D, AKA Chuck D. Public Chuck enemy. D. Yep, so we all were there. Chuck and uh, Bill took me to lunch one day in the class because we were talking about songs and music and beats and I brought up Earth, Wind and & Fire. And they kept turning around looking at me because I was wearing a sweater vest, a tie and a shirt. And I looked like I was I was going to professional college. <laughs> and one day they, they they tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey man, what, what what what's this with you and, and the ties and the thing? I mean, I, you sound cool, but you dress like a geek. I said, no, I don't, man. This is school, man. You know, junior year, I'm trying to be impressive. And this, and then I saw Chuck turn around and he had this Spectrum City jacket on. Now, Spectrum, when I was going DJing, was DJing at this other other college called CW Post. This guy named Spectrum. And he would never give us an opportunity to come up and DJ up there because, you know, he wanted to control and run the whole thing. So when right. I saw Chuck and I saw that jacket, I said, yo, man, why are you doing this to us? What are you talking about? Yo, my name is the group is The Concept. And we've been trying to DJ up there for two, three years. And you keep blocking us, man. I think I need to beat your ass. <laughs> and he was like, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not us. That dude stole our name. And that's why we have these jackets and we're parking. And it's not a word spectrum city with President Hank Shockley, wow. Wizard KG, AKA Keith Shockley, uh, Butch Cassidy, and you know, me, Chucky D. I say, wow. wow. Save the ass whooping. Appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah, come on, let's go to lunch. And then they say, hey, man, do you know about WBAU? Now I had heard about WBAU, which was the sister station to. Nassau Community College, WBAU, but it was um, uh, um, Nassau College was WNC, so NCC, but they shared the signal. NCC had the signal during the day, BAU had it at night. I said, I think I heard about this, but I heard about it because another gentleman I knew, uh, Greg, For Greg Royal, AKA Royal Flash, would bring tapes up there and they would play them. So I was at the studio or the radio station was in Hempstead. I never knew it was at Delphi University. So we went to the university center, went upstairs and bingo, this is WBAU, 90.3 <laughs> FM, 516-747-4757 here. We're bad and you know it. And I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Now I get to do what my brother did. I could still DJ, man, this is kind of cool. So they invited me up to... Um, see what the Mr. Bill show was about. And from then on, the rest was history. Watching Chuck and them take dedications, the audience calling up there. And then I got to meet the one, the only MC DJ Flavor, AKA Flav. Flavor Flav on a high tip. And we became what I call hip hop's greatest incubator ever created. Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. So with people like Rusty J, the late great Rusty J, um, Amy Wachtel, the night nurse, uh, the regular nurse who did news for me eventually, and the the, uh, the Crow sisters uh, who were incredible, and so many great folks that walked through those doors with us, um, we became this whole crew of folks 
that it was all about the music and how to make it better. And listening to these groundbreaking groups like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, yes. Sony G, um, Africa Bambata and the Soul Sonic Force, yes. Curtis Blow, and just marveling yeah. at that, the Crash Crew, and saying, yo, I want to do this Funky 4 plus one more, Sugar Hill again. We're like, wow, we can actually do this. And the thing is, when we were doing it, there weren't enough rap records to spin, so we always kept using uh, different ways and mixing the music, and it became the Long Island Cruise with these cassette tapes. So you had the Townhouse 3, Deadly 3 MCs, uh, Super Spectrum Mix Island one half, which is what they did on Saturdays, with Bill hosting the first half and an hour and a half, and then Spectrum had a mix, mix show hour and a half, because back in those days, the biggest names on radio were Cool DJ Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, and it was Mr. Magic and Marley Mall on That's WBLS right. and KISS FM, respectfully. So we said we have to find our way in Africa Islam with Zulu Beats. We were trying to do what we did out in out in uh, Long Island to represent our crews out there. So we had a lot of crews out there giving us tapes and being a part of it. So that's how the whole greatest hip hop incubator in history began. Yeah, that's how it began. And and you were with Chuck D in a black music history class, right? That's that's where we met. That's where this, the story going to luncheon with Bill, yeah. And so Chuck D, you guys, you know, formed this 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 wonderful bond and is he he's pushing you towards doing this original concept album, bringing it to Def No, Jam? not at all. What happened is that we used to do promos for the shows in the station. So um, it was Keith Shockley, aka Wizard KG, and uh, Butch Cassidy used to talk like, "Yo, what's up, Cuz? Yo, Cuz, yo, yo, yo." <laughs> so T Money and I went down to my um, basement, which we I called the studio at the time. And I came up with the music and the and the drum patterns and the bass line. E Ski played it and we did Knowledge Me for the first time. And we did that and we gave it a bill. They fell out laughing. It was hysterical because all we were doing was promoting the shows, promoting ourselves, and it became like cool. So Run DMC was up there one time and uh Bill was interviewing them and he said, Yo, play that thing that you know, those guys, you know, going, yo, cuz, yo, cuz. And they played it and everybody fell out laughing. They said, yo, this is funny. Who did this? And then they pointed to me and they said, that was Dre and, and T-Money, his crew. And they were like, we were called the most illness B-boys at the time. Then I went back home and I decided to make this instrumental called It's Great to Be Here, which eventually became Can You Feel It? I took oh, the same concept of cool. making the bass lines and the beats and overdubbing because I just loved the, that big booming sound. And the rest was history. And then uh, it was Jam Master J and Run who said, you need to take this and play this with my brother. You need to see Rick Rubin up at NYU. Uh -huh. So I took took that and knowledge me and played it for him. And Rick fell on the floor. He said, this is crazy. Who did this? I said, I did it with my partner, T-Money, my group, the concept. He said, y'all got to sign y'all. This is crazy. He loved Can You Feel It? And he loved Knowledge Me. And he said, how did you get that crazy bass sound? And I said, I did a lot of overdubbing because working on the radio, you learn different techniques and editing and, you know, sound quality. And I always want to make something that sounded different than what was right. going on at that moment. And at that moment, nobody was doing that with, with it in 808. And I didn't have an 808. I had a Dr. Rhythm 110, which is rolling drum machine and all rolling, just all rolling drum machines program the same way. Most of them do. So I, I was just quick to learn how to program drum machines. But I always knew what beats worked in my heart being a DJ. So you know what makes the girls shake their butt. You know what makes the guys go crazy. <laughs> right. So when I played those beats, and I said, we got something here. And that's how we got signed to Def Jam Recordings. So one day we were doing a um, party in Rockville Center. Because we used to do parties all over the place. So by that time, Spectrum and the concept started working together, different, different DJ groups. We worked together to market, promote DJing parties. And some dumbass came and tried to rob us at the Rockville Center party, which didn't make no sense. There was about 12 people in the party. Here he comes <laughs> trying to rob the box. And we're like, wait a minute, man. 
We didn't even make enough yet to pay to be here. Are you trying to rob us? And do this is stupid. Chuck got angry, really angry. And Chuck went back in the lab with Keith and Flavor, and he came up with Public Enemy number one. Wow. And then we took that promo, which is also promoing us at BAU, and we started playing it. And people were like, wait a minute, this is, yo, this is nuts. Who is this? It was Chuck Udv and Flavor. We didn't really wow. use Spectrum City because they had come out with a, a single called Check Out the Radio and Lies at Spectrum City. So Chuck, it, it left a very sour taste on them. And that was on Vanguard Records about how the business really worked. So at the next moment, I started, Rick asked me to uh, DJ for the Beastie Boys because he was getting busy with stuff going on the Def Jam. He and I became very close at the time. So I said, sure, let me try it out. I auditioned for them. They were like, yo, he's really good. Um, and DJ to party with them at the world. And this is before the, any big hit record they had. I they, they had Cookie Puss and they would experiment Cookie with Puss. stuff. <laughs> they would experiment with stuff. But I came along and I started, you know, making the DJ thing work better. So when we go on the road and do parties, we would have uh, battles with boxes. I would have my box and a tape of all the BAU groups and they would have Aerosmith, um, Led Zeppelin, and all their favorite groups. <laughs> so Chuck, Chuck, uh, Public Enemy Number came on, and the whole van just stopped. Said, who is that? I said, it's Chuck and Flavor from the radio. So it's a radio promo. He said, you got to play that for Rick. You got to play that for Rick. That's crazy. <laughs> so I went to Rick's um, NYU uh, dorm room. And Russell was Russell Simmons was sleeping on a on a on a what do they call that thing a futon, and Rick was like, "Yo, everybody's telling me you got to play this thing and play for me." I said, "You sure, Russell's over this thing?" Just forget Russell, just play it. So I walked over to the cassette deck, got to put it on, and it starts off, wah, wah, wah. "Yo, oh. Chuck, yo, Chuck," and it's screaming. He goes, "What goes on?" Well, and as soon as the beat drops, Russell gets up, takes my tape, and throws it out the window. He said, "That's nothing but a bunch of noise." I said, yo, dude, what's wrong with you? He said, it'll never work. Nobody will buy that. Oh. He knew he was wrong. So Rick Rubin actually signed a public enemy to Def Jam. Wow. After Bill and I and uh, I heard Jam Mr. J also told him it was a good idea. And Rick just was crazy. Rick was calling me every day, Trey, Trey, you got to get me Chucky D. You got to get me Chucky D. And Chuck was like, no, I don't want to make records anymore. It doesn't work out. It's a waste of time. So after we all, you know, I said, Trey's, Trey's already signed as, as, as original concept. And we had to change our name to original concept because there was a group out that came out just before we put our record out called The Concept. The concept. So the late great MCA we was sitting in Rick's apartment and he said, well, rest in peace. Y'all are original concept. And I looked at him and T looked at him and was like, yeah, okay, original concept. I hated that name. I was like, no, I'm going to fight them for the name. Let's just the hell with that. <laughs> and it just stuck. It just stuck. And the rest was history. We put out Can You Feel It? Acknowledge Me. And the first performance we ever did is we flew to Miami and we we uh, we were our headliner for uh, two live crew. And when we oh. first played it, Luke was yeah. like, how did you get that bass sound? That's crazy. We had yeah, that. And it? MC Shy D, we MC went to Atlanta, D. we performed with him. Yeah. Yeah, man. We performed I mean, up, up on that. Yep. Then I was then I was on the road with the Beasties and on the road with Original Concept. And we did a big concert in uh, Philly for Lady B. And that's when I first met um DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. So I was DJ for the Beasties. Then I had to go out and perform as original concept. It was crazy. It was crazy. There were times I was flying, I was flying or driving from one city to the other city because we had those amount of gigs going back and forth. So that that's, was the beginning, beginning, beginnings. That's something else. And so now all this stuff is happening. Like, tell me, because I, I, I want to know, how did this? I bet you do. Going, how did this <laughs> you, thing happen? You got the you got to read the book too. Um, well, after I came back from. The Raisin L tour after um, 
the original concept, we wrote a song for Run DMC called Proud to be Black. But we were in the studio and Rick and Russell were like, we need a song, uh, you know, pro-black song, but they didn't want to go to Chuck and do similar what Chuck and them were doing PE because they were doing your bummer to show. So I so said, I could do it. I said, really? Drake, do it. Go ahead. So I grabbed the DMX that was there, had no clue how to program the thing. Turned it on, looked at it, read through it a little bit, and started programming the beat. T Money was over there looking at me, he said, You know what you're doing? I said, Well, I'm good, 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 good. So I started pouncing out the boom. He said, Yo, that shit is hot. Yo, let me throw a shaker on that. I said, Not yet, not yet. And I started pounding the beat. He said, That beat is hot. That beat is crazy. So I said, There you go. There's the beat for it. And he said, but you got to write the whole song. I said, you said, give me the beat and some music. And I gave you the music. No, no, Dre, Dre, make a whole song and bring it back to us. So I took the beat and I went back to rapper G who was working with us. I said, G, we got to do this song. Proud. We got to do a song called Proud to be Black. And rapper G sat there and we went through all the stuff and the names and stuff. He said, give me a minute, give me a minute. And he went, sat down and we started really working. He played the beat, beat, beat. And he said, you know, I'm proud to be black, y'all. And that's a fact, y'all. And you saw it, I'll take it back, y'all. It's like that. <laughs> and he did both parts of Run DMC, Run and DMC. So every wow. time he had proud to be black, he wrote all the words. They didn't change one word. The only thing that got adjusted is Jay was doing the scratching, you know, with the beat and stuff. But that's, he wrote the whole song. So when you look on the album, you see A. Brown. That was me. That was you. And unfortunately... That was a weird deal that I'll explain when you read my book about that. That really went sideways. Still looking for my checks for that. Wow. I'm sure you are still looking for a lot of things because I, I noticed that you you also mentioned something, how your sound was, you feel like your sound was stolen. It was. I, that's, I mean, some people have seen me in other interviews and I express that. And I, I make no shortcomings of people say, oh, we all were collaborating. You were doing this, you were doing that. No, we weren't, because everybody was trying to be themselves. But um, if you listen to the original Rock the Bells, not the one that's on the album, and you listen to Marley Scratch, when Rick did that, I said, yo, Rick, what are you doing? He said, oh, don't worry about that. I said, we need to worry about that. Marley Scratch, I play Marley Scratch. It's a hot record. What are you doing? Oh, it's not as good as this. Ello's much better. Whether Ello was better or not, we still had no right to pilfer that from him. And Ello rhymed on it. It's fine. That's what y'all wanted to do. That's what you did. But I should have kept my damn mouth shut. Because when you go to the album version of Rock the Bells, and you hear that version and play Can You Feel It, don't take my word for it. Get a copy of Can You Feel It. Read the release date. Look at Rock the Bells. Read the release date. When you play the music, it's the same thing. And that's why wow. I took my masters out of Chum King and I went out east to Ian London with Kenny Wallace and we did the original concept album out there. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I got a chance to really kind of listen to it and I mean, make no mistake about it. I mean, it is what it is. And that's, and people say, well, Dre, you're just bitter. What am I bitter about? I created a sound that exists to this day. Yeah. And anybody and anybody want to doubt it, they'll say Dre is really the king of the 808. And that's why I stopped using the 808. I used the 909. I used the Lindrum. I used the SP-1200. I mean, beats is all I thought about. I did the original. I did all the uh, intro music for Yo! MTV Raps. That's what I did. I, I You know, I'm producer of music. And you go back and you go to NWA's uh, early songs. They took Knowledge Me, Can You Feel It? Can you feel uh, it? Yeah. <laughs> and then when I did Pump That Bass, Pump that bass. I, I, wrote, the, that. I, wrote, I wrote that on the back on the back of the Beastie Boy bus during the Raising L tour. And they were like, what are you doing? I said, I got this song in my head. Because I would go out and we would do sound check. And I kept saying, I want to make something that's just like when you hear it, it's going to boom a stadium. And I went in the back of the bus and I started writing on my uh, DR-110. And when we have a break, I'd go back, go in the studio, lay this part down, lay that part down. Got the core cool people to come and do the vocals with me. 
Easy G, I said, easy. I need some crazy statement. You know, come up with them dumb things that you say. And he said, get a little stupid, get a little stupid. And I said, pump that bass. I said, I hate my voice. So I put my voice on and I slowed it down. And they used to call me the VOG. And people said, what's VOG? The voice of God. Dre's doing the voice of God again. And that's how the pump that bass uh, voice came up. So when Bruce, like Technotronics, used it and sampled it, oh, uh, my voice, I mean, I can't even tell you how many groups between get a little stupid and pump that bass. So many. Oh, I, my knew, I, knew, I knew what I was doing. And when you saw the song, I'll never forget the first time when I got the acetate. And we were in, um, I think we were in Atlanta. And the stadium was empty. And I played pump that bass the whole thing. And everybody came out of nowhere talking about, what the hell is that? What Who is did that? that? Uh, that's what I was And I said, my... I said, it's my new song. They were like, when the hell did you do that? I said, on the back of the bus. You wrote the song on the back of the bus? Yeah. And then the, the uh, engineers, they were like, yo, man, you got to turn that down. I said, no, turn the bass up. I want to feel it. I want to feel it <laughs> everywhere. And everyone was like, yo, man. And that was just an acetate. So I only got to play it like about six or seven times till the pressing came out. And everybody was like, yo, this, you're, cre- you're incredible. How do you do that? But those are other stories I have in my book. So you were saying, how did I get the yo? How do you get to the yo? Well, I'm going to leave off the other stuff because I ended up coming back to New York and I did went back to BAU for a while. Then I went to a station called WNWK where Mr. Magic was there. It was called WHBI, but they changed the name. And I started promoting records around the city. I promoted this record, Bad Boys by the Bad Boys, on Starlight Records from Fred Lockhart. Um, and a gentleman who I met several times with the Beasties called Peter, Peter Darty worked at MTV. And he saw me DJing at a, a, a club in the city called The Bank. And I'm DJing there with my late great partner, Ozzy. And he comes up to me and goes, Dre, Dre, damn, you killing the party. Yo, man, let me ask you a question. I said, what? You ever watch your own TV raps? I said, now you're asking me this right now. I'm kind of in the middle of parties. Look, handing me his card. Give me a call tomorrow. And let's get up, man. Let's go over some old time. I said, sure, why not? So I passed the card to my partner, Ozzy. And it had a shamrock on it. said, Peter Darty. I remember Peter because Peter always, we called him Clark Kent because he always had Superman. Clark Kent glasses on. We figured when he took him off, he was Superman. <laughs> and um, they did the Def Jam tour, went through Uniondale Nassau Coliseum, where I grew up. And I went out to the tour with Chuck and them were there, with LL Cool J, um, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Um, at the time, what's his name? Uh, Rob Bass and DJ wow. Easy Rock. And Run DMC and Jeff Master J were shooting the pilot. So I asked Chuck, you want me to go out there and introduce you? I said, sure. It was like 80 degrees in the summer. I have an, a warm black Def Jam jacket, sweating like a bull. So I'm standing on the stage and I'm introducing Public Enemy and Run and DR hosting the segment. And I get caught on camera doing it. Um, wow. So um, Peter says, Yo, man, he invites me to come to sit down in his office, and I go there, and he says, um, what do you think about your MTV raps? I said, it's cool. So we think about Fab. I said, Fab is cool, but you guys need something else to keep people's attention. Fab is a great personality, but, you know, we, you need something to keep people wanting to watch just him with it, besides just the videos. He said, could you come up with something? I said, sure. I do TV all the time. So we laughed about that. And I said, I know how to produce TV. I had no idea how to produce TV. <laughs> sure, man, I can do segments. You know, you want me to help me produce that thing? I'll do it. He said, can you produce what you just said? Sure, I can. Show me. I said, okay, I'll put something together. Um, I'll call you back. So I went back, and T Money was going to school for television and film and all that stuff at um, New York Tech. I said, we got to come up with something. This guy wants to see if, you know, I can produce this TV segment. So we came up with this uh, idea to do something at a barbershop. And a skit that was crazy with haircuts and stuff like that. Because it was, it was you know, back there with high top fades and lines drawn. So we, we went to our barber. 
We set it up. We had somebody as he said was out of control, and he was gonna cut his hair for him that way. So Pete comes out. <clears throat> we drive over to the barber shop, and hour goes by. Two hours go. He's like, "Yo, what's going on? We're just waiting on the guy. He's, he said he's on his way." Now we don't have cell phones at that time, so we're dumping coins and change down a uh, payphone. He goes, "Look, I gotta go. Y'all gotta do something." So I jumped in the chair and I did it because I knew everything needed to be done. Pete took the tape and said, I got it. I'll call you later. So I, I stood in as like I was the the, the, the um, host. And Pete calls me in his office and said, yo, I showed the tape to everybody. We're thinking about making Yo! and TV Raps a daily show. And Fab doesn't want to do it. Do you want to host it? I said, this is what you say? He said, do you want to host it? I show people your tape and they love you. Like, and I'm sitting in the back of my mind going, there's no way in hell <laughs> this fat black man from Long Island is going to be on MTV. I mean, y'all got downtown Julie Brown. You right. got Mark, you know, uh, uh, um, every other, J.J. Johnson and all of them. And not one of them people are fat. I hell no, that doesn't make any sense in my head. So I looked at him and said, think about it. He said, well, I want you to go down there and I want you to talk to my, um, my PA, uh, Ted Demi. So, um, I got up and I walked down the hall towards Ted's office and uh, Ted invites me in and he says, I heard so much about you. I saw your tape. You're funny. He said, uh, you ever done TV before? I said, oh man, I do TV all the time, which was kind of true, but not true because I, I watch TV. I never did TV. So we did some stuff that he recorded. He said, man, it's great. And go back to Pete's. I'll, call, I'll, I'll talk to you later. I said, great, man. Nice meeting you. Blah, blah, blah. And I kept saying, Ted, Demi, Demi, Demi. Why do I know that name? Go back down to Pete's. Pete's and I talk stories about the beasties and what am I doing? And he's like, yo, man, you need to DJ more places. I saw you, you kill it. You need to be doing this. I said, so give me a gig, man. I could use the job. What are you talking about? So he gets a call from Ted. And Ted says, can you send Dre back there? So I get up this time and I walk down the hall and I see this tall, skinny guy with a blonde thing in his head and, and the way, you know, that, that cut at the time. And I'm going, okay, here you go. You lost the job to the skinny black guy. It's done. So uh, I walk in. Yeah, I'm back. Okay. So I walk down the hall. Ted invites me back in his office. And Ed comes behind me. And he introduces Ed. Ed Lover, this is Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre. Ed Lover said, hey, how you doing? He says, hey, man, I know who you are. I listen to your show all the time. I mean, you're good. You're good. So we start laughing, making jokes, and Ted whips out the camera. He says, you know, I got an idea, possibly, maybe to do this with two hosts instead of one. I said, sorry with me. So we saw these Jamaican roster wigs with dreadlocks on it, and Ed and I grabbed them and put them on. And we did this whole Jamaican roster takeoff thing, and Ted was crying, and he filmed it. <laughs> and I said, man, nice meeting you, nice meeting you. Walk back down the hall to Peter's office. Told Pete I'll talk to him later. Pete said, look, man, if you want the job, you let me know. I said, well, let me go home and think about this first. Because, first of all, I couldn't imagine me ever being on MTV like that. I didn't think they'd ever put any Black people on MTV hosting and videoing what, what we were doing. But I thought about it. I went back. I went over to uh, where, uh, Super, where Spectrum's office was, and I talked to Hank and I talked to Butch and Keith and the whole crew, my man EJ the DJ, and I told him what happened. And Chuck was in, at the desk because Chuck is a, a graphic artist, and he was making something up on the desk. And I asked everybody, and they said, "Nah, Dre, that's a sellout move. Don't sell out, man. You know, Ralph and Daniels and and what's the name? They got they got video music box. We can make a show for you with video. We should do something like that. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it." Chuck looked it up and said, he said, Dre, they going to pay you? I said, yeah. He said, you working? I said, no. Fuck what they said. You didn't go get that job. <laughs> you should think about that. <laughs> and I said, Chuck, you wouldn't do it. He said, I ain't worried about it. You need to do it. It might be a damn good look for us. So uh, the rest of the night, I drove around thinking about it. Got up in the morning, called Pete. Pete said, come in the office. Let's talk about it. I said, I'll do it. Wow. And boy, did you do it. And the rest is blessed history. 
um, met Ed, and people say, yo, y'all look like y'all was together forever. We met on the audition of you on TV Raps today. And it was the best thing that ever happened because there was no preconceived notions about each other. Right. Um, everything we wanted to do, we just tried and made it work. We programmed the show together. Ted let us do whatever we really wanted to. So everything that you saw during our time there with our shows, we picked out and we did. So we used to be called um, the homies. And the funniest thing is when we were in MTV at that time, first time I remember walking in MTV and I looked down the hallway, I said, there's gotta be some black people somewhere. Receptionist, you know, maybe there's some guy in the back just shuffling papers, nothing. The only two black people I saw was one guy was holding a garbage can, the other guy was emptying it. <laughs> when we left there, we Ted, oh, you know, as we grew, Martha Diaz came in and became Ted's assistant. Mo Zenboro uh, came in, Todd Brown, Penny McDonald, and the rest started to be, I mean, we had some great other folks in there. Jack, um, Jack Benson's and, you know, that whole thing grew. It opened but, the doors. Yeah, but the thing that, that I would say was the blessing was at nine. And I grabbed T, who's actually working at Federal Express, and he came to visit one time with his uniform. I said, we need to make him your mailman. I said, your mailman? Yeah, we got mail coming in. It'd be a good idea for him to come and bring the mail in to us. Uh -huh. So we had to take the day off of work <laughs> to come <laughs> when we were taping because we would shoot all the shows in one day. And we put a, a black tape on the Federal Express thing. And he became your mailman. Wow. Yeah, that was the yo mailman. Yep. And then from there, uh, to keep him with us and to get him a salary, he started coming up with different characters. And we helped him make characters like the real Michael Jackson, uh, the new Benita, all kinds of crazy stuff that we did. And it just worked out. And everything that Ed and I were doing on that set while we started out, our first guest on Yo! MTV Raps today wasn't a rap artist, wasn't a rap producer. It was actually a rock and roll Hall of Fame um, inductee and, and a person in there who was sitting on the set laughing at Ed and I while we were doing what we were doing. And we said, Ted, who was that over there? And he came back and he said, oh, that's Carol King. I said, you mean to say it, Carol King? Get out of here. I said, can we interview her? Did y'all want to interview Carol King? I said, yeah. She's not a rapper. I said, it doesn't matter. Let's just, let's just interview. Let's get her here. So she came on the set and she hung out with us and she laughed. She was funny. We were good with it. And she was the actual first guest on your own TV raps today. Wow. That's and a when great we did that, question. yeah. And when we did that, it opened up the doors for us to do anything with anyone. So it didn't limit us to just rap artists, hip hop, and nothing against that. But we wanted to make our show on MTV more inclusive of everybody. That was that was the what? major point. What was your favorite episode? Don't have one. You favorite don't have episode one. was the first and the last. Oh, the last was, was classic. That's it. Because what, doing what we did we didn't have time to sit back to critique and overthink it. When we first had the first 30 minutes and we'd only have like a minute and a half to do stuff, every episode and every moment was great for us. From famous episode that was uh, um, brought to the court for Tupac, where Ed had to put his hand over his mouth, we had to shut him down because that ended up being used against him in the court of law, to yeah. Pam Greer, coming on and sitting next to us, fell in love with her always, growing up with her, the late, great James Brown, doing the Ed Lover dance with him on stage, John Amos, and we all know John Amos from Good Times, yeah. Die Hard, to every great thing that he did on screen, to Howard Stern yelling at us on the radio, to Mel Gibson showing up in a kilt. I mean, we opened Mel the doors. Gibson. Mel Gibson, yes, Mel Gibson. Shaquille O'Neal running on and taking off my bigger clothes. And taking my jacket to, I mean, I, there, there's no great episode. Now, some people go to the last episode because of the MC and all that stuff, but there were so many great moments in between. There were. They that were. we can't even Absolutely. deal with. Talk about when we did Yo Live from PE to Run DMC to um, watching the uh, uh, 
leaders of the new school performed with Buster Ron busting out. But some of the greatest moments we've ever done was our spring break shows that we did down in Daytona. I used the to love. I was so go ahead. I'm sorry. I used to love those. The one thing that was so incredible about the one year we did it, when Ted says you own this channel, there was a hurricane. I mean, full hurricane. Poured, blew the set away, the whole nine yards. But we had to do the show because everything was that intertwined and locked. So we went out there after it rained. They swept off the stage, set up the turntables, and we went out there and we saw 50,000 kids of all creeds, colors, shapes, oh sizes, everybody wet, and went out there with the late, great Bismarcky, oh. these are the new school, Tribe Called Quest. Um, it wasn't Tony Loke. Who else? Because I always forget the other person. Cypress Hill. Mm. Everybody went out there and performed and ripped the place apart. And when you see that, you say, we're doing something that matters. Yeah. And we had our own talk show called This Show, which we had Roseanne and Tom Arnold on, Super Day, the late, great Super Dave Osborne. Tony, Tony, Tony was our house band. Yeah, we thought we'd done a few things. Oh, you everything done? that we did <laughs> and everything we did on, on MTV, we always caused a stir. I mean, Adam Sandler was one of our coolest people, Colin Quinn um, from Remote Control. We even had Bill Cosby was on our show at the Eye of the Cosby show. And Ed actually went out and was a guest star on one of his, one of the shows that came on. I went and did the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Prince, right. Yeah. I remember that episode too. Yeah, so we we knocked down trees and forests and put up a city. And as that was all going on, we sweated. So when people say, what's your favorite? You tell me what's a favorite. I don't have a favorite. One oh. of the favorite episodes I had is when Ed and I brought our mothers on for Mother's Day. Oh, that that's, was fun. That's special, right? Yeah. And remember, we did all this before, all, before BET even had a show. Yeah. Yeah, this Probably. is what, what we did. We tried to make sure that when Bobby Brown had stayed the week and MTV lost their minds, they were like, how did you get Bobby Brown? And I saw him at a party the night before. We knew we were taping the next day. He said, yeah, I'm going to come by. I'm going to come by. I'm like, yeah, you come by. And I knew Bobby for years uh, from uh, New Edition. And it did many uh show with him prior to that. And when he showed up, everybody was like, is that really Bobby Brown? Get out of here. <laughs> Nobody at MTV knew we had Bobby Brown down on the set. So we did a week with Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown did that love a dance. Thing went crazy. So we used to take a week ahead. No one knew Bobby was going to be on the show. So when the execs and everybody was watching the show, and we said, now, very special guest, Bobby Brown. And I'm playing my opera rock band. And the executives, the talent bookers, and everybody was screaming at Ted. You didn't tell us? What's wrong with you, Ted? I just want to see if you know what the deal was. And at uh, that time, Bobby Brown was becoming the king of R&B. Everybody yeah. watched the home TV. And the thing is, we found more about it as we left the studio and went to Jamaica and we did um, what you call it down there. Uh, in Jamaica, we did several weeks of shows down there together with Fab. We would go to L.A. and people were like, ah. People were screaming out for us and we were looking like, what? What the hell's going on? It was a whole nother, it was a whole nother thing. When I met Stevie Wonder for the first time at Motown, uh, the funniest thing he said to me is, I said, Stevie Wonder, this is Dr. Dre. He said, oh, you're Dr. Dre? I watch your show? I said, you don't even know who I am. He said, you're Dr. Dre, you're on TV raps. I always watch your own TV raps. I said, is he kidding? And he was laughing. He said, yeah, he watches your own TV reps. I said, um, no disrespect. How do you do it? I thought you're blind. He said, wow. I'm still can hear. And we just kept laughing and we were joking. And a lot of artists, uh, R&B artists, and a lot of folks out there gave us a lot of love. And some people worked as welcoming as Stevie was, but a lot of folks. Um, 
the late great Roger Troutman, he and I sat on a bus for two hours and some of the best education I've had talking to him about music and the business and stuff. And it's just, so when you say, what's the greatest episode, every episode, the episodes where they were intimate one-on-one -on -one with Ed, the episodes where we brought people up that people didn't know, and then they got to know and be a part of it. So we had quite a, quite a, quite a um, blessing. Yeah, just, I mean, quite a blessing. And, and I mean, then you do the movie, Who's the Man? I mean, just, I mean, you, you guys just, what a run. What an amazing run. And now you got the book. What's the name of the book? Can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's called, it's called um, uh, Your Biggest Stuff. The Dr. Dre episodes from 1985 to 1990, 1980, no, 1989 to 1995, which talks strictly just about MTV and what went on with us. Wow. That's that's phenomenal. That's That truly is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Really is phenomenal. We'll have to come back when we have it finished and let you uh, check it out. Absolutely. We definitely got to do that. And I just want to let you know, man, I thank you so much, brother, for just sitting down with me and, and, and telling me about your historic journey with MTV and all that good stuff. And just everything that you've done is just absolutely phenomenal. And the next time we talk, we'll talk about uh, becoming the kings of radio and fighting to get a syndicated deal on Hot 97 in New York. We started the first ever morning hip hop show with Ed, Lisa, and Dre. And that was hot ninety seven. That was hot ninety seven. Oh, we used to do hot ninety seven in the mornings, and then go take your MTV raps in the afternoon. Yes, we did, and we beat Howard Stern in the ratings before wow. he left to go to Sirius XM. Yes, we did. That's something. Then we, then we left. And we went to New, we went to LA. We did the beat for over a year. Then we came back and we did the same thing with Power One Hundred Five. We started it. Then I did yeah. a, I did a late night um, Sunday morning show called Dr. Dre's After Hour Spot, which became the number one show on Power 105. One. Yep. I've done quite a bit. You've done so much for the culture, man. And we definitely got to get you back on, man, because I, I know that, that that's going to keep going. It, it ain't stopping anytime soon. We got. We definitely got to get you back on because we got to talk a little bit more about the book and all those good things. And I just want to thank you so much, brother, for giving we gotta me the, out the Zoom. We got to figure out how to work the Zoom with the AI and all this. I'm like, where the hell? The what? So, <laughs> me being be, me being a blind amputee and a type two diabetic, I consider myself super B A D, super bad. So we got to talk about that in my chapter two and what I'm about to launch. From New York to Los Angeles, from Houston to Mississippi to Detroit to wow. Miami, all over the place. Yeah, we got to get back and talk about that. But let's reach out. Let's not disconnect. Let's continuously connect. And I thank you for this blessing. I thank you for your time. And I thank you for the love. And I thank you as well, my brother. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dre. And I got the real Frost with two capital T's. That's right. It's very important that we, we remember that with two capital T's in the building. How you feeling, brother? Oh, man, I'm feeling great. Blessed to see another day. <laughs> I tell you, it, for one, I want to congratulate uh, you because the Chiefs, the Kansas oh, City yeah. Chiefs. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> they know. They know. Yes, sir. And, yeah, and you, you know what's the? You know what? You know what sucks for me is that I am a Las Vegas Raider fan. Oh yeah. And and, and I'm telling you, man, I I got to give it to you guys because you guys have just been doing it. <laughs> oh, man, look, appreciate it, man. It's gonna, it's gonna happen, man. Y'all gonna get it. That stadium was beautiful, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I fuck with the, the you know, so I, I like the Raiders too. You know, my my uh my brother in law, he a big big Raiders fan, you know. Oh Got yeah. A lot of fans to really rock with him. For oh, real. Cool, cool, cool. So thank you for uh making me feel a little bit better. And uh congratulations once again to those Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, they've done phenomenal. And speaking of Kansas City, Blue Springs, am I saying that right? Missouri. Yes. What was it like growing up in Blue Springs, Missouri? Oh man, it's it was calm. You know, it was a suburb, so not not a lot of action. We had a uh, high school was really good. You know, a lot of uh, state championships. Our uh, high school band uh, would perform a lot of times at the Macy's parades. You know, for uh, was it for Thanksgiving? And um, I mean, it it was cool. Blue Springs South. They brought uh, David Cook, American Idol. Wow, winner. So you know, it was it was okay. You know. Definitely had a good upbringing. Family did. My well, parents did an amazing job. Everything that's they could. Phenomenal. So, yeah, that's phenomenal that you had a great upbringing. And and, and see, you know, you, you you know they don't hear these these stories when you when you when you're dealing with artists. It's always the, you know, the stereotypical thing. You know, I I, live, I grew up in the hood and I was dodging bullets while I was had a had a baby bottle in my mouth. You know, but yours yeah. is. You're you're honest to to your upbringing, and I already love that right away. So, oh, man, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's not it's nothing like it. I grew up both of my parents. No 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 records. No in and out of prisons. Father raised me, my brother and sister. You know, so we had we had a good family, great upbringing. Again, he my father he came from East Orange, New Jersey, so it was a little rougher for him. Joined the army. Right. You know, did what he did his thing. So, you know, for me. I didn't have all them hardships that a lot of people have, a lot of the struggles. Guys, I just had to go to school, get an education, and, and be something using this. That's right. That's right. And and let's let's talk a little bit about the music side of things. Was was the music something that you grew up raised in? Was your family very musically inclined or or was just music always around? Uh, my music inspiration that come from my my father used to play the turntables. He had them in the basement, you know. Up, like I said up in New Jersey, you know they had that. They, the they basement, get down baby. <laughs> so I mean that was that was where I got my inspiration. I'll be in down there on my little seesaw, rocking back and forth. Pops were playing everything from Eric B. Rock, Ken, Lauren Hill, MC Light. You know he throw in some Michael Jackson, Bob Marley's. You know every all the all the genres how he blend them together that that kind of gave me a love for the different styles and really saying something rather than just yes just being right and you know what that's so true man because i mean i me me personally i grew up listening to eric b and rakim and the Kara's ones and the people that were actually saying something Instead mm -hmm. of just being, I love that. I love that. Now, you you are a guy that I can tell your father had influence on, and you also are a father of five sons. Yes, sir. Five sons, ranging from fifteen to one. Wow. And, and what's the names of uh, of those uh, of of your children? Uh, all of them A's. I have Isaiah, Andre, Amari, Alistair, and Amayan. That's cool. Now, I, yeah, I wanted you to be able to say that because one of these days, they're going to see this interview and they're going to see their shout out. And I think that's kind of cool. It's like, oh, they love it. They're a big part. They're a big part of the music and every everything about it. So they encourage and strengthen me. So yeah, I make sure to Everywhere I go, I give them a shout out before all my performances. I like to have the crowd, you know, shout them out, you know, just let them know I'm a father. I took a little bit of time away to do this thing that I love. And again, after this, I'm going home to my boys. That's, wow. that's, that's what that's what drives me. I love that. Now let's talk about the love. So now the love for the music, it transitions to a professional um, 
you know, a professional position. Now you're you're moving and you're getting more and more serious with the music. What was your first project? And tell me a little bit about it. So my first project, I was you know back in 2012. Um, I had made a song called Promo, just off the basis of you know just something you got to get out there and promote yourself. Um, yeah. I was actually uh, it was actually a lesson from um, Frank Wade. Uh, he's doing big things out there in Vegas right now with C Spot Global, and yeah. um, it was you know he told me or he had said to a lot of us that. You have to you have to build your brand. You know, you are your brand. If you don't know who you are, you know, so you can't expect other people to know that. And one of the things that I wanted to do was start off with the promo. Um, I did a little a little small EP at the time. But it just it just kinda got me out a little breakout into the into the local scene, getting onto the stage, and it was just really about, hey, you know, here I am. I come with metaphors. You know, bars galore. I I love it, but I gotta I always gotta remind people to believe in themselves. That's my that's the key with any project. Believe in yourself. That's how I got. That's 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 what you need. If you ain't believing, you can't expect anybody else to. That's so deep because especially when you're doing something and you're trying to be great and you're doing something independent too. I mean, if you don't have belief in yourself, forget about it. I mean, it's just horrible. It, it, it's it's a horrible fight when you don't believe in yourself. But it's a it's a easy fight when you believe in yourself because the only person you're fighting is yourself most of the time. Correct. You know, yes. yes. No, no one's really in your way. Now, no one was in your way. So after the first project, you continue and you move on. And now I want to I want to fast forward this. Now, do you feel like you're developing skills, you're, you're honing your craft. What were some of the experiences that you went through the learning curves as you became this artist now professionally? See, now, I think the growth for me, God, I'm sorry, uh, it just cut out, my bad. Um, my bad. Repeat that for me. It had cut out. I'm sorry. My thing is, so now after the first project happens and you are fast forwarding, you're going on to the next project. What are some of the experiences you're going through? What are some of the things that you're learning being an artist that you would like to share to the audience? Um, one of the one of the main things I've learned over this journey is you have to invest in you. You have to understand marketing. You have to understand the importance of, you know, funding your your dream. Yeah. A lot of what I do from that first project, I, I love being on the stage. So a lot of what I do, I have more of a focus on the stage presence the actual, um, say, the production side is what I grew more into. Because as an artist, you the creativity, you have blocks. You know, you'll have your times when you'll be looking for your inspirations. For me, it's always been a continuous thing of, again, believing in myself, believing in yourself, finding something, finding your way, and not letting anyone hold you back. So a lot of the things that I jumped into was with my travel with um, out of town shows, you know, get out, get yourself in front of people. Yeah. And if you keep continuously doing the same shows with the same people in the same spot, you know, repetitive, you know, they say insanity, you're doing yeah. the same thing, expecting that, a different outcome. That's right. You know, like in the last, what I, I put a timestamp on it last 10 years, According, shoot, according to Google, I've been around the world two and a half times. Wow. Everything from walking, cars, buses, trains. We've I've driven uh moving trucks with, with bro. You know, everywhere we go, you know, we'll stop and we actually you actually you know, actually speak to people. Get out on the ground and talk to people. You have to interact and engage. And that's 
a lot of the hurdles that I've seen with some people, it seems like, oh, they just dropped a single, they blew up. Yeah. Other people, seems like they just doing it, doing it, doing it, and they're not making it nowhere. I've seen so many people who give up on their dream, and it's maybe the dream, again, it's it, you got to have steps to it. Can't just hop to the top. You got to so, have steps to it. If you don't have steps to it, then you can't step to it. It's like that's a lot of the things that I've had to learn over the over the years of me doing the music and uh, like I said with the travel and everything, and it's kind of led me to more of a like I said behind the scenes production level, and just the encouragement to other artists everywhere I go. It's the oh my gosh, Frost, we see you, you know, doing this travel. We see you with the championship belt. We see everything. We just want to know. And I'm gonna tell y'all, all you have to do is believe. It's not you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be gangster. You don't have to have that to make it. You need this right here. You need heart. Come on now. Now you're hitting me. You're hitting me right there. I think I felt that. You got to have that soul, man. You got to have that heart. And the heart of a champion. And speaking of champion, Top Mike's champion, 2021, 2022. I mean, come on. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, that was that was a game changer for me. Um, Top Mics is a their independent little tour group. And they what they do is they'll set up shows um, in different states to bring out different artists to the state. Better to network. You get around you again. You never know who's gonna be in the audience. And for me, it was an opportunity to go to East Orange, New Jersey, and where my father's from. Wow. Uh, I have my grand I have my grandfather there, so. He was actually recording for me, and it was me and him. The um, old school group, the Outsiders, were there. The Outsiders, okay. You know, so it was it was it was really great to be in a different atmosphere. I went by myself. You know, can't be afraid to take a solo mission. Sometimes went up there, loved the energy. I loved the community. Um, I gave him, I gave him my one, I gave him one track. Went up in my Patrick Mahomes jersey. You know, it was all chiefs out. Went up there, gave my track last night. I had the party jumping, and yeah, they they say your boy Frost just kind of stole the show. Hey, you know it was amazing. And then, Frost, um, uh, you were cold. Say, look, got gotta be. I gotta remain cold. Coldest on the planet. Coldest <laughs> man alive. You know. Now went back to next year, twenty twenty two. Um. You know, shout out my guy Mozzie. He was the two-time champ before me. I feel like he passed the passed the torch to me. But you know, we went back. We did our thing. Another venue. We had more of a showdown, standoff, and I mean, the energy was just amazing. You know, again, shout out, bro. I love everything that we've been through. Every, all the all the shows, all the promotion for each other, the uplifting. Because that's what I gained. It wasn't just an opponent, my competition. You know, again, now I have a brother in music. You know, yeah. but a brother to help uplift, a fellow father, you yeah. know. And it's like, guys, that's what it is with, with this music is the champ. I'm the champ. I'm going to show y'all. I'm leading the way. It's ain't about cockiness. It's about leading. I'm trying to lead y'all to success. That's what it is. Wow. You just, you just heard the champ speak. And you can also hear the champ speak on his recent project. Let's talk about John Kramer. Oh yes, John Kramer. Uh, for all the Saw fans out there, it was just a moment of again stepping to the side, step inside the mind of a man who wants to make a change by unorthodox means. Wow. I try to go the nice route. I try to, you know, extend that help whenever in situations where a lot of times I'm told I shouldn't. To say you you should, you didn't have to do that. You don't have to. I don't have to, but that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, right. You right. Know, I get told, you told a lot about these these rappers today. A lot of rappers kind of feed off the negativity. They I'm not gonna say they encourage it, you know, but again it's it's a widespread thing. It's not enough of the knowledge and the uplifting and the ones that do kind of push to the side. That don't mean you gotta stop. That don't mean we should ever let up on it. So you gotta continue. And 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 how do you feel about the the current state of 
hip hop in general, the music scene? Do you feel that it's 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 going where you want it to go? Or are you the person that's going to make it go to where you want it to go? I feel like for me personally, it is going how I want it to go because more and more people are understanding that this music is not cutting it. You Ooh. know, the biggest Dang. example of late, Killer Mike. People are still just, I don't yeah. understand. I don't understand who who is that? My my sons came to me to say, who who is Killer Mike? I don't understand. Remember that football game y'all play, that Madden game? Yeah, he's got a song on there. Remember that one? Yeah, that song. Yeah, that. You know, when you yeah. get into the music and you understand where it came from, what inspired, you have a better understanding. Y'all may not understand who Killer Mike is, but if you listen to him, that man is telling you and his community and everyone else how to do better. Right. You know, it's, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the old heads right now are still doing their thing. They're not making a comeback. They just ain't went nowhere. That's right. I love, I love you saying that because I mean, for him to get those Grammys, I thought that was so instrumental to the continuance of real lyrics, real stories and everything that, it seems to me that you represent. So, yeah, that's what it's about, That the lyricism. If you aren't saying anything that's inspiring, it's like I'm not a you shouldn't make music at all. Okay, all the beat bops and beat bop baps and all that. And there's, there's music for everybody. That's the point mm -hmm. of music. But when you talk about hip hop, <laughs> right. hip hop is about knowledge. It is about overcoming obstacles it's about not being held back breaking through boundaries you know it's about strength it it's 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 not about i mean in my opinion it's not about rap rap is i can do this anybody can rap yeah tiktok look at it three-year-olds can rap at this point right. they want to sign the next <laughs> 10 year old rapper it's like okay you you, you can rap it's hip hop when that message hits you like you know what, I'm 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 gonna do better. Right. Again, I grew up in the suburbs, but the one of the bigger inspirations for me was E40. You know, a man who actually came from the streets, actually had to do do what he had to do to make yeah. it to where he is. Yeah. You know, it's like to me, it's like I, I hear what you're saying. The avoidance. Don't don't cut, try to jump into the streets. Don't try to, you know, glorify this life that we live in because because you I, I mean, I guess we make it look cool. We just trying to tell you to stay away, to do right. better. And that's that's the key. That's yeah, the myth. And that's great responsibility because there is a level of responsibility when you're trying to be a top notch artist, just like anything in any career. You know, when you want to be great, there's a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, we're going to be playing one of your tracks on the show, and we got Let It Go. And and you know what? I want you to let it go. And tell me why you called it Let It Go. I titled this one Let It Go because there's there's so much going on in the world. There always is, but even just, just right now, guys, there's so much fighting, anger, war, you know, uh, persecution, doubt, distrust. There's so much going on. Some things, though, we gotta let go. That's in order deep. to help, in order to help somebody else who's really hurting, we gotta let go of that little stuff. In order to be that strong, you know, yeah. group people. So that's deep. That's deep. And you know what? I mean, there's mental health. There's, you know, this show's called Mental Margarita. So it's an, it's an escape. What is your escape away from the harsh reality or the things that you're going on that's going on in your life? And I think one of the remedies uh, to deal with mental health issues is to let it go. Yes, definitely. That's, that's one thing I learned from a little short session. It was like, yeah, when, when that stuff gets to you, when it builds up and you, you feel like there's nothing else to do, you have nothing else, 
I mean, letting it go is just always the – it's hard, but once you let it go, you continue. You move forward when you let go what's holding you back. Great, great. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. I don't want you to let go of this guy right here. The real frauds with two capital T's. Now, how do they reach you? Uh, you can reach Frost Facebook, Derek Majors Jr. You can reach me on Instagram, the real Frost. Um, email is uh the word eight e i g h t numbers one six o six a Gmail. Um, or just Google Frost with two capital T's. I'll pop up somewhere and we'll be able to connect that way. For sure. And listen, we got to bring you out to Vegas. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll come out to Vegas when the Raiders are playing the Chiefs. <laughs> Look, that would be a great one. I would love that. I don't want to see a smile on your face, though, after the game. <laughs> Pleasure getting with you. The real frauds in the house, man. Let's shake the world. Let's do it. the mix if so i think that you'll like, you'll this. like this tell me what you think of me and then tell me what it takes to be your lady and i'll be everything you need i'll be the one take you home and drive you crazy tell me what you think of me and then tell me what it takes to be your lady and i'll be everything you need i'll be the one take you home and drive you crazy, crazy, crazy. i know i come up to shine